Welcome back to the Fright Night Film Fest, Fandom Fest 2011 in Louisville, Kentucky. This is Strebo with you from MutantVille.com. I am very honored to be joined by Mr. Larry Drake from Dark Man, Dark Knight of the Scarecrow, and Dr. Gr Dr. Giggles, also known as the D Trilogy, which we just coined about five minutes ago. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, sir. Everything I do starts with a D. That's all I know. I don't know why. But, um, um, no, it's interesting to be here. It is my first um, convention like this. And um, it's been very pleasant. Uh, the people are pleasant. The, um, I hope I've been pleasant, mostly, I think. And uh, <laughs> it's just hot. That's all. <laughs> Thank God the air conditioning is working a little bit better today. <laughs> Well, at uh, Mutantville.com, we've come up with a series of questions to reveal your psychological profile, both as a fan and as a creator. So, let's get started. Question number one is, what is your favorite horror film? The Fly, with uh, the Jeff Goldblum, Gina Davis fly, which my friend next door, Mr. Pogue, wrote. But that's coincidental in seeing this film. It's just, it's a great film. It's a kind of distorted love story which is what's wonderful and I found myself getting emotional at the end and even tearing up a little when they get ripped apart by these uh, uh, super real circumstances hyper real they're, they're surreal there we go circumstances but it's still you care about them enough that that matters you care about them as characters and their situation and it's, there's a, a, an ounce of tragedy in it it's great that's an excellent choice, and as I was just <laughs> discussing with Mr. Pogue, it's also my favorite horror yeah. film of all time. So yeah, it's a. Taste. It's okay. <laughs> so what inspired you to get into acting? Acting, I think, yeah. <laughs> because I couldn't do anything else. Uh, it's, I I'm not sure exactly. I can't say it was a one a one moment decision. I, it started, I imagine, in junior high or high school. Oh, Drake, you're funny. Okay, I was getting attention. There was a performance and being funny. So maybe I, deci I decided to explore it. I did high school plays, and I liked it. I studied drama in college. And it's actually worked out. That's not always the case. It's actually worked out as a career. And um, cool. And I hope I've gotten better since then. I hope. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I hope. Yeah, exactly. Well, you've starred in some real classics over the years. Um, all cult classics, if not more. Uh, yeah, at least cult classics. Least Dark, yeah, yeah. Dark Man, Dark Knight of the Scarecrow, and Do Dr. Giggles. They all have their own rabid fan base. So um, let's start with Dark Knight of the Scarecrow. And how did your involvement in that come about? It was my first paying job I got when I was in Los Angeles. And glad to get it. It's a CBS TV movie. I knew a couple of the producers, and they just came to me and offered it to me because I'd done a short film for them, and they worked with me. They just offered me this. It, and I didn't even have an agent at the time. So I'm going. I'm first meeting with my agent. I had a CBS TV movie in my pocket. I had their recommendation. They were working professionals. How could the agent not sign me? He did. It was great. I had an agent. And the job itself, glad to get, cool job, cool character, cool script. So I was kind of in heaven. It's it's, um, and it turned out well. It uh, executed well. The story's interesting, and the story is not in. Uh, maybe because it's on a TV thing. Maybe I don't know, but it's not g awfully graphic. Uh, it's. It, uh, it's a it's more mystery than it actually is i think horror and yes yeah, but in the end the only logical conclusion is the scarecrow did it the ghost did it and that's left hanging in the air at the end of the movie and i think that's cool too so it's very cool and it's actually a movie that we were very inspired by on our own when we came up with our own uh, scarecrow movie scarecrow at midnight <laughs> um which is very different but uh it was an inspiration on us how's what's the fan reaction been like to uh to dark knight over the years was it something that, that just slowly crept up on you well i was a i was aware it had a life after uh, the initial airing it kept popping up in reruns on various stations for quite a while and i knew it had a life in the other world. Uh, 
<laughs> the non-theatrical world. Um, but I was, I've, I've only been lately realizing how large that um, following is, the, how many people love this. And I've been exposed to that while I've been here at this festival, my first autograph signing. But um, it's interesting to me just how, how it affected so many people I've met in the last three days. Uh, first scary move I ever saw. Oh, my God. That, that kind of stuff. These People love this movie. And I'm proud of this movie. So this, it, it's a good thing. Right? Absolutely. It is something to be proud of, as we discussed with Mr. Feigelson earlier, that uh, this is one of the finest horror-themed made-for-television movies ever made. I mean, it is very atmospheric and chilling, and it has a real heart to it, and it is, it, and it is very worthy of whatever praise that it receives. So we're all happy to see it hit DVD and Blu-ray uh, very, very soon. So uh, how did your involvement in Darkman come about as the sinister Durant? Um, I was on a TV series called L.A. Law, and uh, I think it was the first it was within the first year or two I was a couple of years into the series it was uh, the film I was offered and I took a while to decide whether to do this um, not that I'm being too judgmental but my concern was if you've seen it I play a guy who chops people's fingers off with a cigar cutter I'd never heard of that before when I read the script I'd never imagined that and I just went okay I, but it's fascinating, so it's it's plus because I've never seen it before. But at the same time, I consider the negatives, which I've been doing my whole life. I, some call it a problem. I consider the negatives. The negatives might be some twelve-year-old kid in Chicago decides to imitate me with a twelve-year-old friend of his. Let me show you how this is done. <laughs> uh, so that slowed me down a little. But mostly, it was a great character. It was. Um, has no redeeming social value whatsoever. He's a nasty bastard, and I'm playing the world's nicest guy on television, and I thought if I played the world's nastiest man, it would show 180-degree range. But in Hollywood, I think it just confused people. Who the hell is this guy? So uh, uh, make it easy on us. Stop doing different things. So... Um, and I was basically using it as a, a jumping away from, on LA Law, I'm exposed to like 20, 30 million people every Thursday for an hour as a developmentally disabled character. And at the time, I think a lot of people thought I was in that in real life. It's I did. <laughs> the, meth, the method acting myth that you are who you play. No, it's acting. But I had to do something in my career to illustrate that I'm not that guy. Uh, I took every interview they asked me to do. I always dressed differently. I had my hair different. I did everything I could to n disassociate myself with that image. But it's still tough to do. And this was a great role to uh, for something new and totally different. And that's what I enjoyed about it. And that was an opportunity. And it was Sam Raimi, who's Mr. Style. And... Uh, a movie with its tongue firmly in its cheek. So it, it was amusing and stylistic and uh, cartoony, comic booky. Uh, what was it like working with Sam Raimi? He, he was uh, one of the most amazing uh, horror directors to come along in years and has turned into a fantastic mainstream director as well. Yes. He, uh, when I worked with him, it was like working with the pizza delivery guy. He had on these high top Converse, and he looked like too young to be in charge of all this, and you know, t-shirts, jeans, and, but great sense of humor, wonderful, wicked sense of humor, which you can see in a lot of his films. <laughs> and Sam was a lot of fun, wicked, dry sense of humor, and uh, it's like he was pretending to be a director in some ways. He actually was. I was on the set, and he was doing it. A producer came up to him and asked him about casting for this one role. It's a woman who turns into the camera and screams. That's her whole thing. The producer asked him, who do you want for this? And he said, Holly Hunter. And it took a second or two for the producer to go, oh, funny. <laughs> so, very dry, very nice. Uh, and But what I liked, he didn't push the acting one way. He had what he wanted. And he just added his inimitable Sam Raimi 
style at the time. He he made sure the movie looked like a comic book, and he was constantly reminding you in the way he shot it that it was a movie. And therefore, you don't have to worry about this happening to you, but you can if you want to. <laughs> Here, we're doing a movie. It was it, it, He's very cool. Very cool. Well, moving on to Dr. Giggles, um, you had the honor of playing in what was probably the last of... Believe it or not, what's become its own little iconic uh, slasher uh, character with, with Dr. Giggles, kind of at the end of that whole slasher cycle. So yeah. how did your involvement in that come about? I'm not sure. It was just an offer. I did an audition. I didn't go looking for it. The offer came in. I took um, a month to decide whether this was the right thing to do. And eventually, it's interesting, in that month, they doubled their offer. Uh, so that was made it more tempting. <laughs> M money is good. Money nice. And um, I finally gave it to my friend Chuck here, who um, I said, would you read this and tell me where, how it, gonna, if it's going to change my career? And he read it. And I remember his phone message the next day. It said, you can do this. Your career will survive. But, hey. <laughs> He had his. He had some of the same concerns I did, and but he was right. Uh, it was at the time in contrast to the 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 character I was playing in L.A. Law, and I'd already done one kind of shocking thing in Dark Man, and this was kind of cementing me in a certain direction. That was my primary concern. Is that, and people say that it's pretty much the second movie you do, not necessarily the first, that kind of puts your career on a path, and it did. Uh, that sort of put me in the horror sci-fi genre. I was at a party once, and a lady said, and I, I, I said as my joke, I said, talking about my career, I said, apparently I have a face that's good for scaring 12-year-old kids. And she said, yes, you do. <laughs> and I said, you're supposed to argue with me. <laughs> but that, that that's part of the essence of it. It's, it's a lot of... Hollywood casting is physical. Um, so I don't know. And we make all sorts. We do this. It's like high school thinking. We make all sorts of assumptions about, from people's physicality about who they are really. And I kind of look like a truck driver and talk like a school teacher so I confuse people. Uh, well, you're not supposed to sound like that. Uh, and I've ended up playing a lot of nasty, evil people. But it's... Um, it's okay. They're they're interesting characters. That's the fascination. And there's a challenge in getting all that right and getting the style just right. And somebody asked John Gilgood to define style once, and he said it. And he was talking theater references, but he said it's knowing what kind of play you're in. And I still haven't found a better definition. But to understand the style and play to the style. And even in, in the, the, the movies we've talked about, there's different styles. We've talked about Raimi's kind of extreme tongue-in-cheek stuff. Dr. Giggles is less so, but it has its own exaggerations. Nobody uses a needle that big on people. And they, all those props were built especially for the film to get laughs and to, 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 to take it into another world. And uh, a Dark Knight of the Scarecrow is base, a realistic thing that has a realistic style. Except at the end, you, your conclusion is, my God, the ghost did it. And you have to sort of believe in the supernatural. It's the only thing that makes sense story-wise. So there's different styles of things. So um, it's my job to figure that out. Well, Dr. Giggles was, it was a fun movie. It was really the last of that 80s subgenre of slashers where they just had kind of campy fun with it. It wasn't necessarily filled with subtext but i really got the feeling from it that uh they were trying to launch a franchise it felt like it was almost too late in the cycle though if it had been about five years earlier it would have been a lot more successful but um did, was there any initial discussions of hey let's 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 think about doing sequels it was in my contract that uh for like two sequels or something rather i'm actually kind of glad that didn't happen uh i don't consider Dr. Giggles a slasher because I think it's too it's not it's 
it's it's got its sense of humor that alleviates that it counters that but the director said before we started shooting he said i want this really funny and i want this really scary and that's an interesting attempt in a film if you can get them really laughing and then scare the hell out of them in the next minute and vice to just jump all around and um it's and, and i think that keeps it from being like pure uh just you know gore slash stuff but yeah he killed a lot of people he's a crazy man apparently that's what he did so um you may be right about the timing of it and i think i think largo would have loved what, what they called it at the time a tent pole sort of franchise right keep the, the roof over their heads i think that was part of the planning i think that's why it was in my contract to do more but ultimately i'd be a richer man today but ultimately i'm glad there weren't sequels enough was enough i did it it's there do i really want to hammer myself and everyone else into this dr giggles corner so that's all right well, you never know. They might bring it back even at this late date. But it was a fun little movie on its own. But, Mr. Drake, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the laughs, the thrills, the chills, and the drama that you've brought us in your career over the years. And we look forward to many, many more. Thank you. Thank you. Damn. Fantastic. Did you get it? Did you want one? Right. All right. Cool.